Good morning, everyone. Thank you so much for joining us for this uh, second talk of the morning. We're going to be discussing the need of museums in Web3. If you want to come and sit down or stand up, whatever you feel more comfortable doing. Um, there's a few empty seats, so if you want to come closer, feel free to. And uh, good morning. You made it to the second day of this conference. <laughs> it's already a great achievement. I hope you guys have fun. Last night, not sure which party you went to. There were several. Um, <laughs> but it's been a great ride so far. So I'm Serena. I don't know if um, you know me, but I've been in the space, as everyone says, for about three, four years now. We'll tell you a bit about what we do at MOCTA, which is the Museum of Contemporary Digital Art. And today uh, we have Filippo Lorenzin, who's the artistic director of the virtual museum that we're going to tell you all about now. Marina uh, Ribakova, uh, that also coordinates all the operations with artists and uh, special projects. And then the one and only Bruno Pizzalis, <laughs> who I'm sure you've seen being uh, vocal on Twitter and different social media, but he's our uh, brand awareness. A person also taking care of all the communications we do at the museum. So this is only part of the team. Um, the rest is scattered around Europe, <laughs> but um, this is who we are. So uh, welcome again to this uh, session about uh, the need of museums in Web3. So <clears throat> we have several projects. Good morning, guys. Thank you for joining. Um, that we will uh, share with you. So soon you'll see getting some slides on screens that will display what we've been up to uh, in the last few years, but just a bit uh, of history of the museum before we get started. So um, back in 2019, I was um, working at the Tate Modern, primarily in the UK, before the pandemic hit and uh, Brexit also became a thing. And my life was kind of like a dream. I had a dream job. I was supporting artists. I was working with artist estates, working for the commercial side of the gallery, producing limited editions in physical format, so prints and anything that could be an edition. So I thought I had a dream job. I was living in London. I was like, yeah, very happy with that. And then all of a sudden, something happened. And uh, that was Brexit pandemic. But prior to that, crypto happened. And I don't know if um, some of you was, um, any of you was present at the Christie's blockchain, art and blockchain conference that they did back in 2018 in London. That was one of the very first conferences that happened. Um, my co-founder went there, Dominic Perini, and he told me about the magic of crypto art and NFTs that no many people knew about it before it became the word of the year last year on the uh, Collins uh, vocabulary, right? Yeah. Um, so I started thinking about how these uh, processes could be integrated in the contemporary art field at, and at the Tate. At the time, uh, most people looked at me like I was talking about a scam project and they were like, don't even mention that word, like, no way. And I was, you know, remembering uh, I remember working with uh, Damien Hurst and Henny on selling the editions they did back then before the currency project was even a thing. So those days, you know, seem to be so far, but only like a few years ago. However, we're here today talking about Web3 museums. And the topic of this conversation is telling you about how can we coexist with organizations that we believe are well-established and we'll respect them because we'll go inside a physical museum and we somehow feel, you know, like we respect what we see in the room. And how different is this from walking into Decentraland, the sandbox, area, uh, spatial, or any other metaverse, and how are we perceiving exhibitions that are in virtual environments yet curated by people, <laughs> same people, but in a different environment. So I just want to address those points and have a conversation with you. So before we do that, I would love to know how many of you do actually visit museums today? 
and how many of you do visit museums in virtual? So how often do you go to museums like physical museums, you go buy a ticket, see an exhibition, IRL? Often? Pretty often. Great, great. Cool. How many of you do go to private viewings or happenings or uh, virtual exhibitions in the metaverse? Any of the metaverse? Fewer. Cool. So I want to ask to those people that go to museums, physical museums with walls and paintings hanged on the wall, what prevents you from going to the metaverse and seeing a, an exhibition? Did you know about it? Was it because you didn't know about it? You were not invited? Or you don't feel it will be the same kind of like um, experience? Any of you want to share a story? You? Perfect. Tell us. Um, yeah, it, it does um, feel a bit less special comparing to going to uh, the Met, you know, when, when it's a building with like very noticeable physical artifacts. Um, and I'm kind of curious to hear how can we change the perception of that, that physical artifact is important. Thank you. I think most of us feel that way. But what is that we can do to make it a pleasant experience and still have an enjoyable learning while we do visit the metaverse. So I'm going to start addressing that question and pass on the word to Filippo. And whenever you guys are ready at the back, if you want to start sharing some visuals. Um, <clears throat> so we're going to tell you about how is that we communicate about art in a way that is fully digital. <laughs> so. Um, Filippo, the Artistic Director of MOCTA, if you can tell us a bit about what we do and the purpose of the permanent collection at MOCTA. Absolutely, thank you Serena. Can you hear me? Yes, you can hear me. I can hear myself. Okay, that's perfect. Um, yeah, so thank you Serena for the introduction. As you said, I'm the Artistic, the artistic Director of MOCTA. I was appointed in February, I started collaborating with Mokta, that's me. I started collaborating with Mokta in October 2020. Uh, I've been, you know, working in the field of digital art for over 10 years. So when things were much, much, much different from now, as probably many of you know. Uh, so of course it was very interesting for me as a curator, you know, uh, to get involved into the crypto art scene and more specifically, you know, the, the field of exhibiting and, you know, presenting works in uh, virtual spaces, which is, at the end of the day, nothing really new in terms of how, you know, artists have been presenting their works in the real world. I mean, in the past 100 years, probably more, there have been many artists trying to, you know, to present their works in, you know, unusual, uh, surprising spaces. And, I mean, for me as a curator, it is very interesting to, you know, to map the limits and opportunities that, me that the metaverse, um, you know, offers. Um, it's always very interesting to work with artists that have never presented their works in the metaverse because more often than not, they have very creative and, you know, surprising ideas for what they want to do in this space. And don't get me wrong, I'm sure that all the teams we work with, you know, Arium, the Central End, and so on, I'm sure they are very, I hope they are proud of working with us, but it's always, you know, a bit of a struggle because, of course, you know, they have to come up with creative solutions to questions that probably, you know, they never had to answer to. Um, now, to go back to your second question, so the permanent collection. First, what does it mean to have, like, a permanent collection in something that is digital? Because I think most people would think, oh, I'll go visit the permanent collection of the VNA, which is one mm -hmm. of the largest digital, physical collection of like generative art and so on. So you will go to London, you'll go to South Kensington, see the VNA's collection, where actually Filippo used to work. But now that we're putting together a permanent collection that, you know, the purpose is to exist beyond us, mm. how are we going to do that? I'm glad you mentioned the VNA, simply because it's one of the best examples of traditional museums where you have you know, a very small percentage of a collection on display. I don't know if many of you know that, but it's, you know, it's common practice that uh, when you enter, you know, when you access, when you enter a, you know, a traditional museum, more often than not, you can see only like the 30, 
40, 45% of the real collection. And so the rest is in the vault. <laughs> the rest is in the vault, Somewhere exactly. In the world. Um, so, you know, that's already a big difference between the traditional museum, you know, traditional museum, <laughs> let's say, between a building displaying a collection, you know, with the limit of the physical space and what can be done, for example, in the central end or even, you know, just by sharing our wallet address at the end of the day. Um, of course, there is a level of curation, but it's, you know, it's very different from what uh, traditional museums tend to do. Um, when we say permanent collection, you know, the mocked up permanent collection, we really mean permanent. Um, it's quite interesting. I used to work, uh, I used to teach history of new media art, um, you know, a few years ago, and every time I started talking about you know, net art, so, you know, early 90s, early 2000s works. Uh, more often than not, I had to rely on the screenshots I took when I was an art student, like, 10 years ago, because, as probably most of you know, all the original links are broken, or the technology just got obsolete flash. over time. Just think about Flash. Um, and that's, I think, a very good example of how we shouldn't rely too much on the idea that once you put something online, it stays online forever. Um, technology changes, uh, technology, you know, changes very fast. And, you know, as a museum, you know, our mission is to preserve and document what's going on now, what happened in the past, and more importantly, what can happen in the future. But we have to think about how we can preserve these works and, you know, it also depends on the wish of the artist because let's say that an artist says, look, I don't want this work to be available, you know, in 2,000 years from now. That's absolutely fine. We can't say no to that. But on the other hand, we have to do our best to ensure that, you know, the works joining our permanent collection will be available, you know, even beyond the lifespan of Mokta, um, you know. Yes, thank you so much for that. I think an interesting example was uh, the one from Nanjun Pike who, for example, clearly state that, uh, you know, once those TV screens that he was using back in the 70s, in the 60s and 70s, you know, they will have to die at some point. So the, replace, the, the, the replaceable pieces of those screens, you know, they're, you can't find them. So most of the archive is, you know, not visible, so you will just have some memorabilia of an old TV screen. So that's what we are actually discussing with digital artists today. What will the future of digital art be once, I don't know, quantum computing will be available? What will happen to blockchain? So, you know, these kind of questions. So, thank you so much, Filippo. So, I will now pass on the mic to Bruno and Marina. So, what you, will be, uh, what you are seeing now in the screens here is how we actually speak to people and artists in the metaverse and online and how we do curation in the Web 3.0. Um, so, of course, most of those talks happen on social media. I'm sure you have seen it. And uh, we do curation of works on a weekly basis, but we also do exhibitions in different metaverses. Um, all of this, though, comes with some challenges. How do we make money with a museum in the Web3? Hard, isn't it, right? Okay, so we don't have public funds. We don't have, like, people investing in us because we are not a marketplace. We're not like a, a business, per se, in that sense. So. We had to come up with some creative ideas to make this a full-time job, and we're still looking for solutions to make this happen, so we'll get you involved later on on this. But Bruno and Marina, tell us about the foundry and how we came up with this idea. You want to share our wallet first? Because we were talking about... In case you have donations. <laughs> but I don't know if we have the next video maybe with the... Yeah, we, we might have the next <laughs> video going with the, the foundry on the back. So, yeah, um, I mean, we began the discussion about uh, um, the best way to preserve art uh, from the past. Uh, but actually, we at Mokta are trying to find new ways to you know, help art to come out. So, um, as Serena was saying, one of the main problems is to find the best way to be sustainable, which means, um, yeah, basically trying to find the money in, in order to help artists and to uh, trying to shape 
the art world into the digital space. So uh, our last, last project is called The Foundry, and The Foundry is a, a virtual residency. We offer uh, one month of, um, of residency where we uh, choose the artist, then we give to the artist the support from a curator, a tutor, and um, our communication team. Um, they all work together for a month, and they also work with our um, de uh, development team from Arium to create an exhibition where they can actually show the, uh, the new collection and where we have a curatorial tour and we do live, so we try to um, make the discussion about NFTs uh, wider. And um, we try to uh, involve as much as we can people from outside of the space. And to, this, to do this, obviously, in a, like in a monthly time, it takes a lot of work, and so we do have a team of, what, five, six people working every month about this project. Um, Marina, she is the one that tries to coordinate everything. As you can imagine, we are working in a, in a new field, so it's very difficult to be on time most of the time, and that's something that we're struggling, you know. But um, the most interesting thing about the foundry is that we're trying to make it to become a DAO, so in a probably three to four months time, um, the community uh, will actually choose what artists can take part of the foundry. Then we will have a council that will take uh, the propositions, then we'll discuss it and give it back to the community again. So, Again, we're trying to find new solutions, uh, not just to exhibit, but even to create art. And, you know, this is very exciting, but to make it livable, every day we're trying to find new solutions. Uh, yeah, just to add on top of what Bruno has mentioned about the Foundry, which is a staple project in the, so to say, non-permanent side of Mokta, so besides the permanent collection, which is the founding, <laughs> the founding uh, column. And uh, as the residency, it's obviously curated, so there is a curator who is dedicated and who, who has weekly calls with the artists, so the artists you're seeing now, the exhibition on Arium Metaverse by Kevin Abosh that we did in February, and it was the first ever uh, space to be launched uh, on the Super Rare uh, platform, uh, even though I must say that we as the museum, as institution, are platform agnostic, blockchain agnostic, uh, technology agnostic, so we experiment with all types of marketplaces. We work with a number of uh, partners, and in that sense, we're very open to, to new things and collaborations, uh, obviously. And um, the exhibition with Kevin, as I said, took place in February. It was a first kind of uh, approach uh, for everyone, both for the platform that hosted us. I both know Kevin is around, so we can yes. definitely ask him. <laughs> a how testimonial, it was for him. Uh, definitely, and it was a, a great experience uh, for everyone, starting from uh, the curators who worked with him on the collection. It was a collection dedicated to a Valentine's Day about love and technology. And, uh, yeah, as you can see, there's uh, videos of the exhibition being projected. Um, it, it had great commercial success, which to us, as the museum that operates as a hybrid model, so we don't necessarily, we don't make money with the permanent collection because these are never for sale. Obviously, they're donated by the artists, and there is a way for us to sort of create merch or additions on top of these, uh, but obviously, uh, the goal and the mission of the museum is to preserve them for generations and to keep that kind of sustainability. Um, so, yeah, the Foundry project, and we just launched something yesterday, actually. We didn't go to any parties. <laughs> we had an opening last night. We stayed night. in working. <laughs> we, we stayed in. It was in. fun. 
We stayed in and worked and there was a metaverse opening and a drop of uh, the new collection and new exhibition by Render Fruit uh, that you may, some of you may know, a uh, great uh, digital artist uh, that we loved working with. So please feel free to check out this new exhibition. It's sp stunning, spectacular. Um, yeah. Thank you so much. So something that uh, came up in what you guys have been discussing is the fact that up until now we've been sort of like curating art, but what we're aiming for in the museums uh, of the future is that communities will take part in what the um, curatorial process is going to be like and also what we should preserve in the future, like what we should keep for generations to come. So what Bruno was talking about, the DAO, is that both the permanent collection and the foundry will be opportunities for exploring new DAO systems in which you and everyone else should be included in what the future should be having as a, as a testy, testimony of the, of the present. So that's what we're aiming for and that's why we need everyone's support to discuss together whether this is the way forward, or whether there are different ways of looking at art, but also culture, we live in the present and we want to extend to the future. So we're gonna have everyone discussing that very shortly. Uh, but in terms of um, sustainability and also projects and how we've been uh, discussing that with the artist, I want to go back to Filippo and ask you uh, how the process has been of putting together a permanent collection and how this is going to look like in the metaverse dimension. Because uh, something we also do is trying to have a presence also IRL. So how do we combine virtual exhibition and physical exhibitions in a way that makes is fluid, sense. makes sense, so people don't have that feeling of like, oh, I look at a screen and I'm walking into uh, you know, a room or I'm actually heading to a link and browsing through an exhibition virtually. So how do you balance out a virtual exhibition and a physical exhibition? And then Bruno can tell you a few stories about the show you recently opened in Milan. Sure. So first of all, the permanent collection will be on display um, in our building in the Central End. Uh, we have an amazing building where we present our special exhibitions and where, again, where we present our permanent collection. By the way, you are all invited at the opening of Do Not Touch, which is the new special exhibition. It's a group show opening on this Saturday, on the, on the 9th of, um, of April. Um, so yeah, of course there will be a floor, there is a floor displaying the works of a permanent collection and that's just amazing. But yeah, as you mentioned, the idea is to, you know, I will say that the permanent collection is more, serves more as a sort of excuse to talk about digital art, not only to the ones that already know a lot about it. Um, our mission is, a, you know, is educational, meaning that you know, we can't talk about the same things to the same people over and over and over again because that will be just a waste of time for everybody. So we are way more interested in involving, you know, art students, in involving people that not necessarily, you know, know something about digital art or even contemporary art in general. Um, so, you know, we are collaborating with many museums, uh, art platforms, I'm talking about, you know, traditional IRL, um, museums, uh, you know, that, you know, I suppose that because of the NFT craze, I suppose that many of them, you know, got very interested in what's going on in this scene, meaning that, you know, they are looking for partners that can, you know, that can help them to present digital art. Our permanent collection is very important because it allows us to talk about what we do, you know, um, in collaboration with the artist, because just to let you know, um, let's say that the donation process is very long. Usually it takes months just to decide which is the fittest work that, you know, that should join the collection. Uh, so sometimes, uh, you know, sometimes artists suggest, you know, brand new works. Sometimes it happens that, you know, maybe they want to go, you know, a little crazy. Maybe they want to present something they have never made before. You know, they were just looking for the right opportunity to, to do something 
uh, you know, um, something that maybe was, wasn't going to be that successful in terms of market, in market values? Yes, because let's remember, as a museum, we don't focus on works that are going to be, uh, you know, uh, great selling items, but we focus on things that are actually meaningful uh, for the artist and for the public that is experiencing that work. Yes. So just to pose on that for a second, it's Absolutely. not just about marketplaces. Absolutely. And then, you know, you have other artists who, you know, who really want to donate works they made like 10 or 5 years ago, simply because those were the first works they made, you know, by using a certain software, by using a certain hardware. Uh, or maybe because those were the first works they made by following a certain creative path. So again, for us, it is very important to use these works as a way, you know, as a, yeah, as a way to talk about the unique features of digital art and more importantly, the context of when and where those works were uh, made. So yeah, we spend a lot of time, you know, getting back and forth with the artist and I will say that that's probably one of the most important and more exciting parts of, you know, of working at the permanent um, collection. And actually on this point, I know this wasn't prepared, but I'm going to surprise you all. I know there's a couple of artists in the room that are part of the permanent collection at Mokta, so I would love for them to share how they actually felt about donating a work that is going to be part of the collection and preserved in the future. So I know maybe not many of you know him, but we have Nacho Frades in the room, who's this gentleman here in the front row. And uh, he's been one of the very first artists that you know, came through Kadaf and uh, got to meet me on, a, on a, an online talk. But um, he's very talented and uh, he was one of the very first artists that donated works to the permanent collection. So I just want to ask you quickly, what made you think about Mokta as a place that could keep your work in the future and uh, be preserved that way? I know his English is not the best. Maybe you can speak in Spanish if you want. <laughs> um. Ah, eh, hello, hello everybody. Eh, I donated the, the, the words to the Monda because I believe in, in the project and, and I think there is, eh, there is um, the museums are necessary for us and, and well, that's that's what, what I think. <laughs> Thank you. Go visit his works and his website, Nacho Frades. Um, also, just to say that we are very much open and willing to welcome artists that are not that famous, you know, in the crypto art space. And the fact that we are making it accessible and available to all, these kind of wants us to be like accessible also to the public that is not that knowledgeable about crypto. But um, we also have another artist that I want to introduce, Andrea Campo, in the middle of the room, <laughs> that we've been talking to recently about the foundry and the permanent collection, but as a, you know, somebody who actually came to us to discuss why donation, why do you, you know, work around percentages from the artist, why should this model be implemented and I think he's completely right in challenging that kind of view. Now, you know, artists are rock stars in the space, but at the same time, curators and museums and organizations may be struggling because they don't have a space where they can profit from what is happening. So um, I believe things like that should also be addressed. And if you love to share your story as well and your vision, feel welcome to. Uh, can we have a video? The next one, please. Thank you. Thanks. And that's the uh, museum in Decentraland. But do you want to share a few words? Cool. So what do you think about curators, platforms, and museums taking a cut from artists? What's your view? Hello, everyone. Um, <laughs> um, actually, it's still something I'm trying to figure out. I mean, it's, I come from the movie industry, so the whole thing, like, 
I never had like a real um, artist, artistic career. I was more in the applied art side. So I was using my art to make something, you know, as a product for big studios. So now I think um, I did well in a way because I, I used to be a freelancer. So in a way I used to, um, you know, social media, uh, marketing, whatever was like already my side. But yet that's a good question maybe for artists that they really don't know how to, you know, be in a space, how to move, how to create, um, you know, um, identity. Because I think that that's the thing where um, smaller artists maybe need uh, once they are in a completely new uh, environment that they don't know they don't know how to move. So I think it's nice to see um, the old art side, you know, um, helping, but in the, at the same time learning together. Because this is a really um, new space, so I'm interested to see. So my question probably is, how do you think you can technically introduce artists to something that is not really defined yet? So. Thank you. That was a very hard question. Thank you so much for answering that. And uh, on that point, before heading to Bruno, um, we are going to open up that discussion because we would love to have your opinion on how sustainable models for museums could and should work in the Web3. So if not through percentages of sale, what else? So be ready to see a tweet coming through on the Mokda uh, Twitter page, which is M-O-C-D-A underscore. Um, and please feel free to respond and join the conversation as we're going to be having a forum at the end of April discussing what the models for museums should be like. So please feel free to join. So as we're heading to the conclusion of this talk and uh, also leaving room for some questions, if you do have any, um, I'd love for Bruno to tell you a bit about the projects we've been having in virtual exhibitions like the one you see here that was curated by uh, Filippo in Decentraland, but also in physical museums. So we currently uh, have a show that opened and was curated by Bruno, the Metaverse section, at the Museo della Permanente in Milan. And I'm also about to open another exhibition with great artists, but I can't tell you much about it, that will be in Florence, in Palazzo Strozzi, uh, if you're planning to visit Italy soon. But Bruno, tell us about your experience as a curator Virtually and IRL. You know, probably, um, you know, it's important to talk about um, the two souls of, you know, exhibiting uh, uh, digital art and uh, crypto art, anyway, this kind of art in both worlds, because uh, we do have actually problems in, um, in each situation, because uh, in the physical world, for example, um, it, it's very hard to attract, I mean, it's very easy to attract people, but it's very hard to actually explain to people what the art is about. Most of the people that come into physical museum, at least in Italy, are not really aware of the movement, of the digital art, uh, history, and so on. So um, this is one of the problems we're actually encountering when we thinking about how to create a physical exhibition. Another problem, as you can imagine, is to find the right support to uh, exhibit um, the works in the best way. So um, even the time we're spending with artists trying to um, find the best solution in, in a tech way to um, exhibit NFTs, digital art, is something that we're really keen on it. Um, on the other hand, uh, with, with, with virtual exhibition, uh, we do have, you know, digital enthusiasts, but we do have the need to try to uh, push the curation side uh, as much as we can. So we do have two different, um, let's say, yeah, topic that we always try to consider and to, 
to use to, to come out with the best exhibition, both in uh, IREL and URL. Thank you. And Filippo, tell us a bit about your exhibition that is about to open in the central end. I can talk about Do Not Touch, which is opening on the 9th of April. It's a new group show curated by Marie Chatel, one of the best curators I ever met. And luckily enough, she's a Mokda curator. She has been amazing in these weeks. Um, it will feature uh, works inspired by the, you know, by the new understanding of touch at the time of digital art, or you know, at the time of digital environments. Um, again, that will open on Saturday the 9th at 8 o'clock in the evening. Uh, of course, you are all very welcome to join us. Um, I would like to take this opportunity to mention also the, the group show we will open in July. Uh, I think that exemplify very well what we are trying to do and actually what we are doing with Mokta. Um, so in these weeks I've been in contact with uh, a number of art schools and art universities from all over the world, including, you know, of course, Italy, Germany, Spain, Portugal, uh, the UK, the US, Argentina, India, China, uh, Cuba, I'm very proud of Cuba. Um, basically the idea is to work with the students of these schools and give them the opportunity to learn more about how they, present, how they can present their works, whether they are digital works or not, in the metaverse. It was quite fascinating because most of the times I met students that, you know, maybe there were like 20, 25% of the students that were studying digital art. But then there was a big group of students that were, you know, learning, you know, how to paint, how to sculpt and so on. And they were just very interested in the idea of being able to present, you know, their very traditional works in the metaverse. So the plan, you know, is to select a number of works that will go on display in the central end in July. But before the opening, uh, there will be a series of uh, workshops, lectures, and curatorial, you know, uh, sessions with these students uh, that, again, you know, they will be from all over the world. And just to give you an example of how exciting this is going to be, um, you know, I was able to understand how difficult it can be you know, if you are from certain parts of the world to access uh, the metaverse. Um, it's a very simple example. I know we still have just a few minutes. Just to give you an example, I, when I met the students of the Shenzhen Art School, I asked the teacher, the teacher is Irish, I asked him, I just want to be sure that the students will actually be able to access the central end because, you know, internet is restricted in China. Um, he said, technically they can't, practically they will, because they all use VPN. And it's the same thing, you know, for the Cuban students. So for us, it is very important to find the best way to ensure that, you know, it, that no matter where you come from, you will be able to access not only this exhibition, but, you know, our collection and, you know, all the uh, programs, you know, we are developing in this um, months. So again, please save a date, the 9th of July. You are welcome to join the opening, you know, at the beach. That's absolutely fine. And yes, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. So I know we've got a couple of minutes left. So if you do have questions about curation in Web3 and how museums can be sustainable and coexist alongside public institutions, please come and find us. Uh, we have time maybe for one quick question, if any of you is brave enough to raise the hand and ask one. If not, please come and say hello. We have Bruno, Marina, Filippo and myself, Serena, here. Thanks again for listening and uh, enjoy your day. We have a question, we have a question, we have a question. Sorry, one minute. Yeah. I'll be very quick, but um, I was just wondering, um, speaking about your actual audience, so the people who are already engaging with you either on the metaverse or digital platform, whatever, are they coming from, um, let's say, a more traditional art background or are they more tech side? So who are they? Who are those people who are already now? I'm afraid I didn't hear the wall question. Who's, who's the audience? Oh, right, oh. sorry, okay, thanks for asking, sorry. Um, yeah, I mean, it really depends on, you know, on what kind of exhibition we are talking about. Generally speaking, we are talking about, you know, people that more often than not know a lot about, you know, the metaverse and digital art and so on. 
Um, but again, our plan is to, is to invite, you know, as many as diverse members of the public as possible, because again, I think it will be a bit solipsistic, you know, to, you know, to talk about the same things to the same people over and over again. Um, yes, I mean, that's one of the reasons why, you know, we exhibit IRL exhibitions. It's specifically because it allows us to get in touch, to involve people that, you know, not necessarily have even the technology to access the, you know, the metaverse. This is something else that the public usually doesn't have, uh, can't, you know, decide. Sometimes the internet connection is not good enough. Sometimes you don't have, like, the, you know, the latest uh, device that allows you to visit certain metaverses. So, yeah, sometimes you can't beat IRL, I suppose. But on the other, you know, on the other hand, there are many other times you can't beat, um, you know, the metaverse, I suppose. But I think this conference has done a great job to bring so many new faces to the space. So actually, I'm so happy to meet so many new people. So once again, thanks to all of you and enjoy your day. See you at Mokka.